Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the annual uh, scientific seminar and thanks to Mount Elizabeth Hospital for inviting me. My name is Dr. Kenneth Chan. I'm a respiratory physician and I've been tasked to talk to you a little bit about the long-term effects of COVID on the lung. Okay, so first up, um, and this slide is already a week old, but up to a week ago, uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 has become the most important healthcare um, emergency globally. Um, and up to a week ago, there are now about 260 million cases and 5 million deaths, of which about 10% of these cases would end up being hospitalized and, uh, and cared for. Um, what we now know about COVID-19, and as you have heard from the previous speaker, uh, its effects actually persist beyond the hospitalization. And this is data that's just fresh out from a cohort in Florida uh, of about 14,000 patients. And these cohorts, uh, the observations were started after they were discharged from the hospital. And, and the blue line represents uh, patients who are hospitalized with COVID and the uh, red line represents uh, mild COVID-19 patients that were either treated as an outpatient or at home. And then they had a, also a control data set, set which is in the uh, red line. And what you could see here, uh, even after discharge and over the next 12 months period, uh, being hospitalized with COVID continues to confer an increased mortality risk and patients uh, continue to have an excess death as compared to patients with mild COVID or even no COVID at all. What is kind of surprising in this data set is only about 5% of these individuals eventually have their mortality um, attributed to a respiratory or a cardiac cause. So it's actually something else, but this is a fairly preliminary paper and they did not describe the actual causes of death. And I, I'm sure there'll be more papers that will be coming out from this particular cohort. So back to what I was saying, um, of the 26 million hospitalizations, it is uh, estimated um, that uh, 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 three quarters of them actually have frank pneumonia from COVID, of which a third of them will have severe uh, man uh, lung manifestations leading to the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And even conservatively speaking, up to 13 million may be left with fibrosis and potential long-term reduction in lung function. And hence, uh, even after acute COVID, there is potentially another epidemic that will now uh, go on. So I'm going to talk about today about the risk factors of pulmonary fibrosis, um, what are the long-term implications on lung function? And uh, finally, do we have anything in our armamentarium right now to try and prevent this sequelae from actually happening? What we do know is the risk factors for pulmonary fibrosis is not dissimilar to many patients with um, pneumonia uh, or severe pneumonia. Uh, age is a risk factor. Uh, severity illness of illness is a risk factor. So if you are, uh, uh, you are admitted to the intensive care unit or you're very oxygen dependent, that puts you more at risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis. And the other risk factor is obviously if your lungs are already activated in the form of an uh, external inhalant such as smoking, that again puts you at risk. Um, what I'm about to say though, I have to say is we don't really have a lot of long-term data from a respiratory sequelae standpoint. So many, what I'm about to say is partly extrapolated from our experience with similar coronaviruses. And everyone here will be familiar with the initial the SARS epidemic in 2002 and 2003, of which 10% of patients died and 90% were uh, survived, but many were left with sequelae. And of course, the Middle East respiratory syndrome, which is still ongoing. Um, this is a fairly recent paper in preprint where they did a systematic review looking at post-viral parenchymal lung disease 
um, and viral pneumonitis. And in this review, they took all observational studies that included um, uh, respiratory viral pathogens. And these included uh, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, MERS, and inf even influenza pneumonia who were followed up to 12 months from discharge. And uh, not surprisingly, on follow-up CT, um, easily up to 40% of them had uh, fibrotic findings, some still had inflammatory findings, and when spirometries or lung function tests were run on this patient, about 20% will have lung restriction and 40% will have a reduction in diffusing capacity. Uh, meaning, uh, in spite of a lack of imaging changes, um, the ability of the lung to exchange gas, to bring in oxygen into the body, uh, remains uh, impaired. Uh, when they looked at the cohort of patients with SARS-CoV, and I will just remind everyone that we don't really have a long-term data at the moment, uh, that the longest data set after discharge from the hospital was COVID, it's about three months, about 43% had inflammatory change and 30% had fibrotic findings. Um, and uh, in another systematic review that was published about three or four months ago, consistent with the previous paper, um, the lung function were uh, impaired. About 40% had altered diffusing capacity. Uh, but interestingly, the false vital capacity was largely uh, preserved in this particular cohort. And those that had a reduction in false vital capacity, most of these uh, changes were actually mild. Um, what about SARS? Um, uh, and the reason why I'm showing this slide is um, um, what we are seeing in COVID-19 is similar to SARS. This is uh, our own Singapore data set of 46 survivors of SARS. In, and uh, again, consistent with the previous uh, slide, 15% uh, had mild impairment in false vital capacity and about 40% had mild reduction in diffusing capacity. Uh, but this did not seem to translate to preserved exercise tolerance. Uh, and when these patients actually underwent uh, a, a very formal way of assessing exercise uh, limitation in the form of cardiopulmonary exercise testing, a good number of them had impairment in exercise capacity, which was not due to ventilatory uh, limitation. So, so not due to the fibrosis or any scarring in the lungs per se. Um, there had been uh, a, a number of uh, postulated causes. Um, many survivors of ICU care uh, or ARDS have impaired muscle function, either because they have received medicines that negatively impact muscle function, just uh, like steroids, for example, uh, to this condition called critical care uh, myopathy, also known as ICU-acquired acquired weakness. And of course, they're all deconditioned after spending weeks to months um, uh, bedridden and, and trying to recover from a uh, severe uh, pneumonia. So those are some of the uh, postulations. Uh, leading to a limited exercise capacity. Uh, what happens to SARS survivors one year out? Uh, so this cohort is from Hong Kong rather than Singapore. Again, uh, fairly similar observations, but what's gratifying to know, as you can see, the number of individuals with reduced force vital capacity drops substantially to only about 4%. And there's also a reduction in the number with a uh, uh, diffusing capacity impairment. And this is actually similar to our own experience here um, uh, in that the lungs do actually heal. Okay, so uh, I'm just showing you an, uh, an x-ray of an 84-year-old patient of mine with uh, severe COVID and he was really sick. He was in the ICU. He had multiple, multiple organ failure requiring inotropes, dialysis, and this, the first x-ray that you see here is the x-ray uh, on discharge. And what you could see is there's still extensive infiltration bilaterally, primarily in the peripheral and basal distribution. 
and I'm still following him up. This is what his x-ray now uh, looks like one year down the road. And you can see, other than maybe some subtle uh, linear reticular opacities in the left lower lobe, most of the lung has actually healed. Um, uh, this is again not COVID, but more data from SARS. And this is actually a cohort from China, okay, of 71 patients. And they followed up their patients. This is literally uh, 15 years later. And uh, the slide is a little bit busy, but what we are trying to depict here with this figure is that most of the improvement on lung injury uh, on CT and pulmonary function was actually just in the first two years. And subsequently, you can see those that did not improve or after that improvement, it actually uh, plateaus. Right, so um, what we can say is if you have severe COVID or hospitalized COVID, there is a good chance that that lung function will be impaired for a short while. But uh, it, uh, on actual uh, measurements, this tended to be mild. Uh, and it seems that uh, it is out of proportion to uh, uh, impairment in their quality of life and their exercise tolerance. And whether that's to do with um, um, ICU acquired weakness, whether it's to do with steroids, and maybe this aligns well with Dr. Young's uh, data, where it seems that a, a pro-inflammatory uh, milieu in the body continues to exist even after COVID-19. Um, I'll, in the next section of my talk, I'll just spend a few minutes uh, talking more about um, uh, can we do anything to mitigate uh, respiratory sequelae or to prevent the fibrosis. Um, there's very little out there, understandably so. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 is a new illness to us. But what we do know is if we can prevent severe illness, prevent patients from becoming oxygen dependent and going on to hospitalization, that in itself will probably lead to less respiratory sequelae. So we all look forward to uh, the oral medicines that has been in the media recently, Molnupiravir as well as Paxlovid from Pfizer. And, and of course, what's already available are the monoclonal antibodies for high-risk patients. Uh, of those that are already hospitalized, especially if they end up in the intensive care unit, uh, what is probably important is any therapeutic interventions that we do need we need to try and uh, protect the lung as much as possible. So while some of these interventions are life-saving, there's actually good evidence now that, for example, if we are over-enthusiastic with mechanical ventilation, we will end up in injuring the lungs even more. So appropriate mechanical ventilation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit on st about steroids. And I think uh, since a number of trials, including the the recovery trial by the World Health Organization. Um, anyone who has uh, oxygen dependent or who is severe COVID, um, dexamethasone or its equivalent has been shown to mitigate the lung injury, uh, enhance uh, recovery uh, as well, uh, uh, recovery from COVID. What I want to point out though, is that we are now increasingly observing a subset of patients where the um, mechanisms of lung injury and inflammation actually changes. So this is another of my patients, um, and he came in uh, just about eight months ago to me. As you can see, he had very bad COVID, you know, and he actually required intubation. And after intubation, uh, uh, we also started him on steroids. And you can see by day six, of steroid uh, about three days after intubation, there is actually substantial improvement in the infiltrates, enough so that we were already thinking about liberating for mechanical ventilation. Uh, at that time, because markers for inflammation such as the CRP, the white cell count, etc., were fairly low, we started tapering the steroids. And lo and behold, about uh, five days later, it ended up with recrudescent disease. And you can see the infiltrates, the oxygenation, etc., worsening again. And, and we had to defer uh, extubation and we had to actually escalate the steroids. And, and the point of this slide was to now uh, 
create some awareness on, on the emerging uh, entity of organizing pneumonia, which is, in a sense, you can again think of it as a, 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 a inflammatory response to the COVID-19 uh, COVID virus that is actually quite steroid responsive. And in these individuals, unlike the recovery uh, protocol for steroids, we actually need to keep them on a lot longer and taper quite slowly. So in this particular patient, I had to taper the steroids over about a month or so. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about antifibrotics. So if the respiratory sequelae consists of pulmonary fibrosis, it then makes sense to think whether there are actually medicines out there that can mitigate this fibrotic process. And of course, this is kind of um, something that a lot of doctors start thinking about because we do have antifibrotics available, but for a different entity, okay, for other kinds of uh, progressive uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, mechanistically, it may make sense, okay, so uh, typically in many forms of lung inflammation, um, it is the transforming growth factor signaling pathway that comes into play. And, and again, without going into too much detail about this particular slide, that leads to uh, activation of a number of the cytokines you have already heard about in the previous, uh, from the previous speaker, hepatocyte growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, which leads to myo fibroblast activation, matrix deposition, and palmy fibrosis. So we've been looking at mesenchymal cells, stem cells for a long time, not just for influenza pneumonia, but for many forms of ARDS. And of course, there's now nintadenib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, that's been kind of well shown uh, together with perfenidone, uh, both of which acting on different parts of the pathway, as you can see in this particular slide, um, uh, actually uh, preserves lung function and controls uh, pulmonary fibrosis, or at least prevents pulmonary fibrosis from worsening uh, in other forms of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, such as usual interstitial pneumonia or a fibrosing form, fibrosing variant of organizing uh, pneumonia. Having said all that, in these particular antifibrotics, the best data are actually in stable pulmonary fibrosis patients, where there's actually little by way of inflammation that's going on. We are uncertain whether introducing this drugs early um, when there's still inflammation that's going on in a COVID-19 patient uh, would, would actually help to mitigate this particular signaling pathway. So, so we await further studies, uh, but at this point in time, they are more probably more investigational and speculative uh, rather than something we would use upfront. So I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, 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 large number of patients with severe COVID may have potential long-term pulmonary fibrosis. And given the number of the world population that is affected by this condition, we can expect that this is going to be a problem in the next decade or so that may, we may need to allocate certain healthcare resources to. Um, they are shown to have a decrease in exercise capacity and quality of life that's not entirely explained by lung function impairment. And whether this again is to do with uh, overactivated uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, we, we await the, the studies. And finally, can we mitigate this somewhat? Uh, obviously, preventing severe illness in the form of the monoclonal antibodies and oral pills together with judicious mechanical ventilation is important. Steroids is important, recognizing it can be a double-edged sword. Uh, but especially so in the subset of patients with organizing pneumonia. Uh, antifibrotics and mesenchymal stem cells are conceptually attractive, but unlikely to be beneficial at this point. Uh, again, thank uh, Mount Elizabeth Hospital um, and also to introduce my team. So the picture that you see on the left is my colleague and myself about to perform a tracheostomy on a patient with severe COVID. Uh, these are the five doctors in Respiratory Medical Associates. Uh, we all respiratory physicians and intensivists. 
and there's a QR code in case you needed my details. Thank you.